Welcome to all of you to this very special colloquium, which is, as we call it, a pre-launching event for the book Peer Discourse and Peer Learning. Many of you know that this day was planned before Shoshana passed away. And the intention was for Catherine, who came especially to be here with Shosh, to go from this event to her home and deliver the manuscript in its semi-final, final form, and meet with her on behalf of all of us. But unfortunately, this event has turned into a memorial for our friend, colleague, and mentor, Shoshana Blumkulka. It is with heavy and very mixed feelings that we are meeting here today. The positive perspective is the fact that Shoshana knew about this colloquium and that she was very much part of its planning. I think this is how she wanted it to be held. This is what she was hoping for, and we are pleased that we can fulfill this last wish of hers. On the other hand, we were all hoping to continue to visit her and receive her mentorship and guidance as she continued to maintain, even in the most painful periods of her illness. Her strengths and her perseverance gave us hope. We all came to believe that somehow she will beat this cruel disease. Shoshana was a very special person, and we all looked up to her for her guidance and vision. I had the good fortune of meeting her in 1981 at an international conference in Lund, Sweden, and that was the beginning of both our friendship and our work together in the field of pragmatic research and discourse analysis. It is there that Shoshana, with her energy, wisdom, and unrelenting passion for research, created an international group of researchers that ended up collaborating for over 10 years and became well known in the field of pragmatic studies. It was her leadership, her hard work, and her unique perception that guided the group, which came to be known as the SARP group, Cross-Cultural Speech Act Realization Patterns. In fact, now that I look around Bed Belgia here, the two of us spent many exciting hours working here in the garden, which is a wonderful place to work. But for Shoshana, this was just the beginning, for the beginning of our most significant work in the study of pragmatics. And as we know, she went on to working on discourse in the family, discourse between children and adults, and of course, her outstanding work on children's discourse. Her collaboration with Catherine Snow was particularly enriching. Shoshana made a significant contribution to many different areas. The teaching of Hebrew as a second language, which was pro probably a bi biographically, chronologically, the first thing. The teaching of Hebrew and literacy in schools. Another very important contribution of hers through her work on curricula. The study of discourse in the many different fields, political discourse as well. And we could talk about our contributions for many hours. But I would like to add two important features to her relationship with others in the field. Whether these were colleagues, students, or collaborators of various kinds. First of all, she was unbelievably loyal. And her associates from different projects and different periods in her life have maintained an ongoing contact with her even after she moved on to other areas and fields of interest. And secondly, and that is particularly important to mention today, is her unlimited devotion to her students. Thanks to her, Israel can be proud of having a very active group of researchers in the field of pragmatics to, him, to whom she was a mentor and a leader and will always be remembered as such. Many of her students are here. And I would like to add one last point on a personal note. Shoshana and I shared a very important feature of our personal lives. We had both survived the Holocaust as children. She came to Israel on the famous Kastner train when she was eight from Cluj, a Hungarian-speaking community. And I came at the age of 12 from Chernovitz, which on the map is not very far from Cluj, Ours was a, a German-speaking community. Both of us became Israeli in all respects. And although we worked together for almost 40 years, we never spoke about our childhood. It was only after 2010 
when I published my personal memoir based on my childhood that we began to share memories. Somehow, I guess both of us were, had to keep it deep down in our hearts. I will miss her terribly. And now a word about today's colloquium. Um, as I said, this was planned as a colloquium in honor of the book, in honor of Shoshana. And of course, that's, we are going to maintain that. It's a very academic colloquium, planned carefully, and we're going to try to hold it as such. But in the spirit of Shoshana and her approach to life, I think we're not going to be as formal as we usually are. And I guess every speaker, that's why we didn't put down the exact times. We're going to keep you to your time, as promised. But we want to be a little bit more relaxed about it. And if people feel that they want to say something personal, I think it's definitely a good place to do so. And now I have the honor and the really great pleasure to introduce Catherine Snow to you. And as we often say, Catherine, you don't need an introduction in Israel. You have so many friends and followers in this country. But Catherine, as a friend and colleague, and who has been here many, many times, today we are particularly grateful to you for having made this trip, especially for Shoshana. And I think that gives us all inspiration. Catherine is an educational psychologist who has always had a special interest in language development and has contributed significantly to bilingualism, to language acquisition, to parent-child interaction, early childhood literacy, and more recently, some of us met with her on the well-known project SERP, uh, which focuses on vocabulary and literacy for high school students in the Boston area. With Shoshana, Catherine published Talking to Adults. I'm sure you all know the book. And they had worked together on peer interaction and peer learning. Catherine is professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and past president of AERA. And Shoshana spent, I think, two uh, sabbaticals with you in 1984 and 1991. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. The delicate passing of the, uh, of the microphone, which is meant for men with suit jackets. <laughs> so we have to kind of hover close to the table where it lives. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, as you can see from the title, this talk actually reflects ideas that uh, emerged, I think, in conversation with Shoshana. And in thinking back over, over those visits that she made to Boston, I realized that, that several lines of research that I've pursued over the years actually uh, probably got started in conversations with her, probably over wine since it was my choice. Um, and um, certainly the work I did on definitions, I remember Shoshana walking in to my office and saying, this is what you just said about definitions, turn it into a coding scheme, whereupon I did. And she um, collected definitions here in, in Israel that we analyzed. I don't think we ever, pub we ever jointly published on that. Um, but certainly the whole idea of peer talk and the value of what children can learn from each other um, was one of the, the background um, sort of nuggets of, of thinking that led to the work I've been doing for the last several years. And um, now I'm pursuing it uh, with uh, much older children than those that, that have, been, have been studied um, by Shoshana and her students. Uh, but I think many of the same principles that she has articulated, the, the double opportunity space um, and, and the, the value of conversations in which people are engaged in uh, those, those special social relationships one has with peers uh, will, I hope, uh, be visible in what I have to say. Um, I, I like to, to start with um, the list of people who've participated in, because I, typically I have a few too many slides um, that I can't get to the end, and then, I, and then the, if this is at the end, you, you never manage to properly, uh, to properly acknowledge your friends and colleagues. Uh, but the project I'm talking about is um, 
It's very large, very complicated. It started in, in 2006 in various forms. And um, these, this is only a small list of the many, many people who've been uh, closely involved in doing the work. And of course, there are uh, a number of uh, institutions that have funded the work as well. Most, um, most importantly, the US Department of Education through the Institute for Education Sciences. Um, so ageless principles about peer talk. I'm sorry, I have to keep looking at that because this is very small on here for some reason. Um, that uh, peer talk in early childhood, as, um, as Shoshana's research shown, um, offers multiple affordances for language uh, development um, that, that are, that are n not necessarily richer than, but certainly different from the affordances of adult child conversation. Adults are always adjusting to kids, or at least some of us are, um, thus uh, making certain kinds of things too easy, whereas children do not adjust to one another, uh, thus they make each other work to get their um, messages across. Um, children in their, in their peer interactions in preschools um, and early childhood settings have the opportunity to develop their own uh, little, t little tiny cultures and rituals um, in ways that uh, don't happen in adult child conversation because as adults we know the culture and the ritual that we wish to impose upon our children. Um, but this happens under these conditions of shared topics and attention, kids at a play -Doh, doing Play-Doh together and exchanging tools for Play-Doh uh, performance or, um, and in the context of robust social relationships, I think we've all seen this, that kids don't enter into interesting peer talk on first meeting. They have to get to know each other a little bit, which is one of the reasons why preschools are such good places for this, uh, for this work. Um, they give, there, there has to be evidence about the effectiveness of communication. Negotiation and productive learning about how to negotiate and how to communicate happens when people tell you what worked and what didn't. And there's nothing more um, directly informative about the effectiveness of communication than being thrown out of the dress-up corner uh, because you didn't uh, negotiate entry properly or not being allowed to play mommy because you don't have the social status that would enable you to play mommy, the highly valued role, interestingly in the dress up corner. So uh, that effectiveness, the direct information about effectiveness of communication is richly available in early childhood settings. And of course, er, young kids, unlike older kids, are always engaged in authentic communication. I mean, one of the challenges of instruction of, of formal educational settings is that so much of the communication that goes on is thoroughly inauthentic. Right? It's not really about things that people want to learn about, and thus the questions and the answers are kind of ritualistic and um, uh, formal rather than deeply uh, authentic. Um, so one of the claims I would like to make is that good instruction all the way up through graduate school is actually much more likely to be characterized by authentic communication. And, and so I hope to show that these same features hold uh, under well-designed conditions for pre-adolescent and adolescent peer talk. And in particular, I'm going to talk about debates in uh, middle grade classrooms. But let me start by sort of plunging in at the deep end and showing you uh, the kind of data we're working with in this project and um, uh, sort of what also, I guess, I hope what we're struggling with. Um, so these are a couple of essays written by sixth graders. Uh, and they were written in response to the, uh, the following prompt, does uh, rap music have a negative impact on youth? Now you can imagine that sixth graders are not immediately inclined to agree that rap music has a negative impact on youth. They tend to be fans of rap music. Um, and also in the good old American tradition, they are defenders of freedom of speech. Um, we've all heard about the first 10 amendments to the Constitution uh, when it's in our own interests. Um, but we uh, help kids develop their thinking about this question and many others in the context of week-long curricular units, each of which focuses on a dilemma. Um, and the dilemma in this case is not, does it have a negative impact, but should it be censored? 
Uh, so we give them lots of information that it does have a negative impact, but uh, the real question is, should we, should we thus limit um, particularly young children's access to RAP? Um, the curriculum takes about 15 minutes a day. It's cross-curricular. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. But um, one of the things that happens as part of the curriculum is that we give kids information on the basis of which we hope they might argue uh, with evidence. And we give them lots of opportunities to develop their own point of view about the topic. Uh, one of the things that they often do is work in, in uh, small groups to uh, construct their arguments. It's a little hard to read on the right, but what this, what this says is freedom of speech is an American right. Don't censor rap music. It might be violent because it's new. Um, if it's censored, you wouldn't have adult music, adult movies. It's just a way of expressing yourself that um, that's something, but it can be, that's like the blues, but it can be happy, mad, or sad, right? So the blues expresses only sad, and rap expresses anger. Um, and, I th and I think this, this last point um, is particularly uh, sophisticated. Heavy metal uh, rock is violent too, but they don't say anything. Um, that's a sophisticated observation on race because heavy metal uh, is white and um, very violent. Um, but it, nobody has ever suggested it be censored, whereas people are always suggesting that rap be censored. Um, so that, that's the kind of workup that kids do in, in preparing their debates. Um, and then we ask them to write uh, uh, little essays uh, about the topic of the week. And um, so here's one of the essays. Um, rap music does, uh, I'm sorry about the spelling. Rap music does have a negative impact because some rappers have lots of money just from writing something that insults some people. Another thing is that rappers don't care what they say in their songs, even to other people. For example, a made up song that will insult someone, that's the answer to does rap music have a negative impact on youth. A uh, little help with punctuation uh, wouldn't be bad here. Uh, but these are first drafts, I should point out. Um, and and it's, a quite a, it's not a well-expressed, but it's quite a sophisticated argument. Um, I, the underlying unstated uh, bit of this argument is that um, if rappers make a lot of money, then uh, they will become attractive role models for kids. And we don't want kids taking as role models, because they are rich, people uh, who insult and fail to attend to the uh, opinions of others. Um, so it would be nice if that argument had been worked out a little more. So that a, um, a does have a negative impact argument. Um, here's another one. I think rap does have a negative impact on youth. Many raps demonstrate violence, swears, and violence against women. Rappers need to contribute and to stop writing bad stuff, or they have to have some rap songs blocked off for kids, 14 and under. If kids listen to it, they might think it's okay to do it. Kids might get the wrong idea. If kids listen to swears, they might repeat it. They also might think it's okay and cool to do violent things. That's why I think rap has a negative impact on youth. So what, what are we doing? What are these essays meant to help us with? Well, the premise of the, of the, of the uh, curricular intervention we're working on is that discussion is a power, peer discussion and debate is a powerful tool because it gives kids actual um, incentives in the context of authentic communication about engaging topics like this, incentives to get better at three skills that we think are crucial to promoting academic achievement. And one of the skills is using academic language, uh, correctly. One of the skills is uh, taking perspectives, and one of the skills is building effective arguments. Um, and these are skills which uh, I, I think people are nodding. I think it's kind of obvious that this is, these are good things for kids to learn. They are not skills which are very much focused on um, in standard instruction, imp explicitly at least. They're kind of implicit but sort of t actually telling kids, look, there's a way to do that academically and there's a way to do it casually on the playground. That's not something that we all do. Um, so um, the, the hope is that we can build into this curriculum in the context of these authentic communicative 
uh, exchanges um, incentives to do more academic language, more perspective taking, and more argumentation. So um, in this essay, where is the academic language? Well, it's, it's I think we'd have to say emergent, not, uh, not accomplished, but there are a few little markers here that, that are clearly academic, negative impact, academic phrase. Um, demonstrate is, is a, an item taken from the academic uh, lexicon. Um, the, the sort of modulation of the claims, I would argue, is a feature of academic language. So um, when kids listen to it, they're going to think it's okay to do it. That's much less academic than they might think it's okay to do it. Uh, one of the features of academic language is building credibility in one's own claims by assuring the audience that they are not too strong for the evidence that supports them. So while, an, a, while a, a more sophisticated version of this would be it is possible that, or we have to consider the consequent, the, the, the possibility that uh, this is still academic in orientation, I would argue. And then finally, the existence of the, the, the claim statement in the first sentence and the summary statement in the final sentence is, of course, a, an academic feature. Um, we have much more elaborate analyses of academic language, I should say, under the influence of my colleague, Paolo Uccelli. So, um, this is just a, a little hint. Um, where's the perspective taking? Well, perspective taking, which is a part of this project that also has elaborate um, instrumentation um, devised by my colleague Bob Selman, um, is, I think, pretty richly represented here. First, the writer represents his own perspective, I think. Secondly, he represents the perspective of, of at, attributes of perspective to rappers. Rappers need to contribute. Rappers need to be responsible members of society. Um, but then also uh, projects um, the perspective of kids who listen to rap. What's going to happen to them? Uh, and so this is at least three major different actors uh, being brought together in a discussion of, of, uh, of perspective take in, in a in a way that emphasizes uh, their perspectives. Um, and then finally, what's the nature of the reasoning? Well, I think the reasoning here is, is, is what I would call emergent abstract argumentation. It's really scenario-based reasoning. Right? Uh, the reasoning is, if, if kids listen to rap, uh, all kinds of bad things might happen. And it's presented as a sort of a timeless narrative, right? Imagine these kids, imagine them listening to rap, imagine them, them going out and doing violent things and saying nasty things and, uh, and getting the wrong ideas in their heads, right? So it's a, um, it's a very person-based argumentation mode. Um, and um, I think that's uh, exactly the way kids at a certain stage of development emerge into abstract reasoning. Um, and in fact, you could imagine this being done, exactly the same argument being presented much more. Uh, the, much, the, the, if we allow rap to be played over the airwaves and uncensored, the, the risk that young children will engage in uh, foul talk and uh, b uh, violent acts is, will be greatly might be greatly increased, right? I mean, that, that's the same argument, it's just that it's a little more academically uh, represented. Some people have argued that academic language is just simple language tarted up to sound fancier. Um, so uh, what does all this have to do with peer talk? Well, I, I will argue that these essays reflect the consequences of classroom debate and discussion, and that debate and discussion are precisely the, th what offer the learning opportunities that enable kids to produce essays, you, you might say that good, they're not that good, but produce essays that get better over time. We have t 20 or so of them per year over several years for some students. So we, uh, we will be seeing development, I hope, um, that's directly related to the debates. Um, and, and that these skills are also relevant to reading, comp uh, reading comprehension. 
All of this has been, work has been carried out in the context of the Strategic Education Research Partnership, which um, I won't explain since I guess I've already explained it here, right? Um, but also, it would, I have a several, a, a two hour sermon about the Strategic Education Research Partnership as being the right way to go about doing educational research, and we don't have time for it right now. So you can hear my sermon on that website if you want. Um, one of the basic principles of, of the Strategic Education Research Partnership, though, is that we do work uh, that is uh, scientifically responsible, but that is responsive as well to the urgent problems of practice, to the needs of educators, practitioners, teachers, principals, superintendents. And the work I'm going to talk about was originally motivated by a school superintendent, the superintendent of Boston, the, the local school um, authority, and he said, I don't know what to do about middle school kids, kids 6th, 7th, 8th grade, they, they read the words, they don't read the, they don't understand the text, help us out. Um, and so we um, started working with teachers to help us understand what they saw as the problem, and one of the recurrent issues they brought up was academic vocabulary. So we started by um, trying to develop a, a, a teaching curriculum for academic vocabulary. And our original goals were to help kids learn these all-purpose academic vocabulary words, the ones that, that don't get taught in any content area. Because you know the biology teacher has to teach photosynthesis, and the English language arts teacher has to teach character, and the uh, chemistry teacher has to teach colloid, but nobody has to teach negotiate, variable, in, independent, disproportionate. Those, those are kind of all-purpose words that, get, that are crucial to the understanding of the, other, of the text, but that are never actually um, addressed. So when we started with the vocabulary as our focus, we, we fortunately had 50 years of good, solid research on what good vocabulary teaching is like, which we relied upon. Um, much of it actually derived from second language uh, foreign language as much as from first language research. Um, kids learn words after multiple exposures, not after a single exposure. Uh, kids have to have opportunities to use the words in reading, writing, and speaking. Phonolo establishing a phonological memory for the words is very important. Um, some targeted direct teaching, but also strategies for expanding beyond the words you can directly teach to a larger uh, category of words. And those were some of our, some of our basic principles. Um, the, you know, easy, easy you might say, except for this problem of how do, you, how do you get, how do you create opportunities for kids to use the words? Right? Uh, the traditional model is look the word up in a dictionary, use it in a sentence, take a, take a quiz on it, forget it so you can go on to next week's words, um, and uh, we really wanted to avoid that by, by creating context for oral use of the words and also embedding the words in subsequent units of the, so that they would have to come back and be used again and again. Um, and so we came up with the idea that the students should engage in debate actually as a pretext for forcing them to use the words orally. Um, so we designed a curriculum um, there's a lot of it. It's on the web. You can find it. Um, we wrote little texts um, designed to engage, to give kids something to talk about with each other and in the classroom context. And so these are the kinds of things we, uh, we selected. Um, should junk food be sold in school cafeterias? You can think of lots of arguments why it shouldn't. Um, it is now the case, I am happy to tell you, that 40% of American adolescents are officially obese. Uh, so that's a good reason not to sell junk food in uh, school cafeterias. On the other hand, mon schools make money from selling food, and they don't make money if kids don't buy the food. Um, furthermore, um, kids don't eat the non-junk food. Uh, they just go out down around the corner and buy junk food if you don't sell it to them. So there are arguments pro and con in this, um, in this particular debate. And similarly, all the other debates here, um, this is a, just a random selection. Um, should athletes be paid multi-million dollar salaries when teachers are making $50,000 a year 
That turned out not to be so awfully debatable from the point of view of 13-year-olds, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. Um, they were all in favor of multi-million dollar salaries for athletes, mostly because many of them think they're going to be professional athletes earning those multi-million dollar salaries. Uh, remarkable how many more future members of the National Basketball Association there are in any, in any middle school classroom than future teachers. Anyway, um, so that's uh, sort of uh, the, the idea that these discussions were built in as a pretext uh, both to engage the kids in the topics and in reading the words, but also in the, dis in the debate that would be a context for using the words. Um, and, and this is just quickly what the traditional version of the curriculum looks like. On, on Monday, kids read a passage. This is about half of the passage. It's a, a page long. It gives them some information about the topic and some arguments. They do a little word work on a word chart that enables them to write the word and look for morphological variants of it. They do a math problem with their math teacher that repeats, that su supplements information about the topic and gives them a, an authentic math problem. Uh, they do a little science activity, again, more information about the topic and some uh, analytic problem that's done in groups. And then the high point of the week for most of the kids um, is the debate, in, which is carried out in social studies class, where they get to pick sides or be assigned sides and actually discuss, discuss the topic. This um, debate we thought of as then an opportunity for kids to sharpen their arguments and hear counter arguments and do a better job on Friday in writing <coughs> those essays like the ones you saw. Um, now I should say that it quickly became clear to us in the context of observing in classrooms, uh, observing teachers and implementing this, this curriculum and observing students engaging in it, that the debate was the big deal here. It was really the active ingredient. It was why kids loved the program. Um, and I suppose that's something I should have anticipated if I really believed in peer talk. But it, was, it did come as an epiphany uh, to us. Uh, Suzanne Donovan, who's the director of the, um, the strategic education, the executive director of strategic education research partnership, um, calls, calls this our Viagra moment. The moment when we, Viagra was a drug that was originally, of course, um, tested in clinical trials for um, circulatory problems in, during surgery. And it was a surprise that it had this other effect, which turned out to be much more remunerative and more widely valued, evidently, um, uh, and so Viagra was repurposed for this other effect in the, in the marketing and the, um, and the prescription of it. Um, well, that's what debate, that's what to happen to us was debate, that we suddenly realized, oh my God, this isn't really about vocabulary. This is about giving kids a chance to stand up and express their own opinions in a social context where they can gain points by doing that effectively. Um, Somebody who we, whom we took to visit one of the classrooms said, my God, it's like a bar mitzvah. It's like where they become adults. <laughs> so um, I suppose you're wondering whether this program, whether we have any evidence that this program works beyond the positive reactions of the kids. Here are data from the very first quasi-experimental study uh, that we did several years ago now, um, looking just at whether kids learn the words we, we taught them. And um, it was quasi, it has, this study has all the problems of quasi-experimental studies everywhere, in addition to typos on it, I see, um, that the schools that agreed to be our comparison schools uh, scored much higher, those are the top two lines, than the schools that, uh, these two lines, than the schools that uh, agreed to implement the program. But by the end of, a, this was about 15 weeks of the program, you see that uh, the, um, the treatment schools were indistinguishable from the experimental schools. And in fact, the language minority students, the non-native speakers of English in the uh, treatment schools had improved significantly more uh, than, the, um, than the native speakers, right? So this is a program that seemed to fill a need. Um, and that was enough uh, data, although it's, you know, obviously has its difficulties, was enough data to get us um, 
to get us some funding to do a proper large-scale randomized trial. Before we did the proper large-scale randomized trial, though, we, we um, wanted to be sure that having learned these words, kids didn't forget them, which is typically what happens with vocabulary instruction. So these are data from, uh, that re relate to just a subset of the words that we um, taught in, in this first uh, panel here. Uh, th so this is the same effect you just saw, that the language minority students uh, learn the words much faster and better. These are scaled scores, that's why they... And then during the summer, everybody forgets some of the words. Um, but we tested the same words at the beginning and end of the subsequent school year when they were not taught. And there was, there was recovery, actually overshoot, um, for, the, um, for the students, suggesting that these are, words are retained and even some of the words not taught are uh, semi-learned in the, in the course of, of the instruction over here. So as I say, we got funding to um, extend this study uh, to a proper experimental trial because these data uh, were, were strong enough, even though uh, the effect sizes were quite, quite small and we didn't have data about anything except the curriculum uh, linked uh, test. Um, but we were very intrigued by this idea that English language learners were, were more susceptible to the, to the program than English only kids. So we created an adaptation focused on English language learners. And um, I'll, you know, a little, those of you who are done work in second language and foreign language will recognize the adaptations. We gave them a little more explicit instruction about English morphology. We gave them some supplementary readings. Um, this is the, uh, the important effect. This was only a 12 week long sort of brief experimental trial. Uh, groups of teachers randomly assigned to uh, uh, control, that's the blue line, or treatment, that's the red line. And um, although this looks tiny, it is a significant advantage for the students in the treatment, treatment group in learning the words we taught. Um, so keep your eye on that blue line, because it's going to reappear here. Those are the, that's the same blue line, but now it's those teachers the next year of the study being, being given the program to implement. And you see that their students in the next year uh, improved considerably more. So uh, from all of this stuff, we learned, we learned quite a lot. We learned that the appeal and value of discussion, um, uh, we really started focusing on that as the hypothesized active ingredient. We learned that there's a potential for cumulative effects. Uh, so a year of this program is probably not enough particularly when it's, such, when it's only 15 or 20 minutes a day. Um, the need for more explicit instruction in discussion. Teachers often didn't know how to do discussion, so they didn't, they didn't or they didn't like it. Um, and, uh, but mostly a need to develop a version of this that was much more intense and uh, with much more control over the quality uh, and fidelity of implementation. Now, wh where did we get that idea? Well, one of the things we did was we collected the students do their work in workbooks and notebooks that we provide. So we collected the notebooks and analyzed a what percentage of the notebook pages were being filled in. So this is writing. Uh, there were about 360 students in this school. And on the very best week of the implementation of the curriculum, 260 kids 270 kids maybe had completed the writing. And on many weeks, it was much, much less than that. And it seemed as if after about 18 weeks of the curriculum, it was pretty minimally implemented. Uh, and across the board, the math teachers and the science teachers didn't do it nearly as much as the English language arts teacher did it, uh, which is perfectly understandable, but uh, disappointing. Um, and so here's another another school, the same, same sort of data. So one of the challenges is how do we fight this decline? It, sort of, it seems as if over each semester, people start out enthusiastic and get less and less enthusiastic. And then there's a little re-assumption uh, uh, after, the, after the winter break, and then it goes down again. Um, and how do we fight the decline? And how do we get the science and math teachers more fully involved? 
the other feature of this is that from school to school, you have vastly different levels of implementation. This is in our randomized trial. These are schools that putatively are implementing, were randomly assigned to implement the program and are implementing it, but you see that some of them are implementing it at very, very low levels. Um, of course, they still have to be counted as implementers in the, uh, in the uh, uh, statistical analysis. Alas, um, reducing our effect sizes um, significantly. Uh, but here's a, the correlation between uh, notebook completion and uh, number of, uh, an improvement on our tests. So you can see that actually doing the program, yay, improves your chances that you're going to learn the words taught. Um, all right, another aspect of the program, and the one that's most central, I think, to, the, to what I'm talking about today, is this notion that discussion is the active ingredient and that quality of discussion should be a good predictor. So one question is, do we, do we have an impact on the quality of discussion? Well, observations in, these are control schools over here and treatment schools over here, um, of using a rubric evaluating quality of discussion, suggests that we did significantly improve quality of discussion, particularly by reducing really, really, really low scores. The frequency of very low scores went way down. This, this is the, the control schools have lots of uh, classrooms that were um, scored one on discussion quality, the lowest possible score. There were a few of those in the treatment schools as well, but not nearly as many. We didn't improve things at the top end very much, which is not surprising because teachers who already know how to do discussion didn't do it any better because of our curriculum. But strikingly, we had big effects on quality of discussion in math, um, huge effects in math, a, a, a standard deviation better in math. And I guess what that reflects is the fact that math teachers aren't usually doing any discussion at all. So any effort to introduce uh, discussion into the classrooms makes a big, big difference. It's not that it's a significant effect across the board in science, in social studies, and in English language arts, but not nearly as big in those um, content areas where discussion is a more normal part of the instructional uh, routine. Um, and so then the question is, oh, I'll skip that. Then, then the question is, does it matter, the quality of discussion? So, um, we, we did, this is particularly Josh Lawrence, whose work I should mention here because he did all the statistical analyses, a multi-level mediation model to see whether uh, the, the direct effect, the, the direct effect on students is uh, significantly mediated by this significant effect on discussion. So there's the direct effect on students, um, highly significant, the direct effect on discussion, highly significant. And the final path there, the mediation, is also significant and explains about 15% of the variance in outcomes. So quality of discussion really is important in predicting word learning. All right, so here we are. We've done a couple of big studies. We've tried to test whether changes in curriculum can inspire teachers to change teaching practice in ways that have impacts on kids. And we've got overall encouraging and, and smallish effects. These are, these are what I call highly credible effects. Right? If you were going out to um, do a, a scientific swindle, you would never report a 0.15 effect size because it's really too small to, to be worth lying about. So thus, we, you have to believe it. But it's not huge. It's not really big enough to also um, you know, be massively enthusiastic about because the 0.15 effect size, it's, if you get that every year, it's still going to take 10 years to get these kids up to um, uh, up one standard deviation toward uh, their peers. So um, how do we make this thicker, more intense, more likely to be well implemented? And it's clear that curriculum helps in these engaging questions. Um, and supporting materials are part of the answer, but clearly more professional development and maybe more uh, intensive approach to presenting the curriculum. That was, um, that was where we were. Um, and also, we had a bunch of 
sort of new hypotheses that had emerged from observing the discussion, thinking about what is it about discussion, what are the affordances of discussion that really help kids get better at word learning or um, with any luck at other do in other domains like reading and, and writing. And it seemed as if one key thing was the engagement. They, they, they're at least paying attention. You're more likely to be learning when you're paying attention than when not. Um, another was perspective taking, this fact that you are really confronted in a, in a debate with alternative perspectives on an issue which are most importantly coming from your peers. They're coming from people who are just like you and suddenly you have to think, well, wait, I've heard from my parents that illegal immigrants should just be pitched out of the country. But he's saying he's, he's got an uncle who's a, an undocumented immigrant. Maybe I should think about this possibility that there's something to be said for amnesty for undocumented immigrants rather than just um, arresting them, right? So the, the fact that peers are representing different perspectives on an issue becomes very important. Um, reasoning, because if you're going to convince your peers, you have to make an argument. You can't just say, because I said so. To give evidence, you have to um, at least tell stories about possible consequences. Um, and academic language, I think, because it has so much power in these formal discussions to raise the status of the speaker the kid who does a better, more academic job of presenting an argument really clearly moves up in the hierarchy of, of debaters, um, at, has more status and more credibility. So those were our hypotheses. These are hypothesized malleable factors. Malleable because we think we could teach kids to do better at any of them, not at engagement, but at, you can, you can uh, manipulate engagement with content and you can manipulate the others with instruction. So we're trying to build those factors into a much richer, bigger, better curriculum um, uh, with, uh, in the current study, which we are uh, halfway through, which is a very large, very um, ambitious study focused on grades four to eight, undertaken in the context of a funding mechanism. The US Department of Education decided four years ago that it was going to do the education equivalent of a moonshot spend all of its literacy funding for five years on five big projects. So this is one of those projects. Um, and, and it gives us a chance to test an enriched theory of reading comprehension. Uh, here's the theory of action uh, that word generation and another intervention that I won't talk about, that they change um, outcomes via um, improving teacher knowledge and providing a more engaging curriculum, uh, all of which lead to structured discussion. Structured discussion leads to engaged, purposeful reading and writing. And here, then, are the malleable factors, academic language, complex reasoning, and perspective taking that we argue will predict reading comprehension. Not, mind you, reading comprehension as traditionally tested. Because as reading comprehension is traditionally tested is so dumb that you don't need these factors to predict it. But reading comprehension as it is properly conceptualized as a very deep and complex process of uh, analyzing text, synthesizing across several texts, arguing with text, um, considering possible alternative interpretations of text, deep comprehension. Uh, the comprehension that everybody in the U.S. is talking about as part of the 21st century uh, reading skills. So we modified word generation in major ways. We brought it down to fourth grade. Um, we uh, produced much longer and more intensive units for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We've given much richer PD. We support teachers' skills at doing discussion much more effectively um, or much more uh, comprehensively, perhaps not more effectively, I don't know. Um, and when we give explicit curricular attention to these domains of perspective taking, argumentation, and academic language. So I'll just give you a little quick hint of what some of this curriculum looks like. This is a fourth grade unit. The question is, should everybody um, have to learn a second language? I've, uh, those of you who have spent time in North America realize that is a highly debatable question there. Um, perhaps nowhere else in the world, but for but of course, but about half of our students are second language speakers of English. So uh, there's, there's a good range of opinion on this as well. 
Um, and we give students um, resources like interviews with experts. This, is, this guy is a, a, an expert on Haitian Creole, um, who of course has strong opinion about the necessity of learning a second language. Um, here is one of those posters that kids put together in preparation for their debate. Uh, it's, this is a pro uh, poster. It's beneficial and it's good when you go to hospitals and um, you can help people and, um, and things like that. Um, another uh, fourth grade unit, why do we wear what we wear? This is part of a three unit series on values. Uh, the effort is to get kids to examine their own, all the influences on them, uh, deciding why they're willing to pay $250 for a pair of shoes, the actual production cost of which is $5. Um, and, and the many different reasons why people wear different clothes, what it has to do with identity, what it has to do with, with culture. Um, these are one of the characteristics of these units is that they're built around authentic texts. We often rewrite the texts to get them down to the right level, but they're really about the world. And that reflects my personal soapbox that one of the problems kids in, middle, in urban schools have is they actually don't know very much. They never read the newspaper, they never watch the news, they don't have dinner table conversations with their parents about interesting topics. So kind of exposing them to much more information, real world information seems to me important. Another one of the interviews, this is a rather famous woman in the US who argues that kids get too many toys and you should really just give them socks. You know, you can do a whole lot with a sock, but if you give a kid, an, if you give a, kid a sock and turn it into a puppet, it can be anything. If you give them an Elmo puppet, it's just Elmo. Right. Um, and um, the, the task here is analyzing advertisements to see, to, to figure out for whom they're intended and what, what, how credible the messages are. Um, so those are just examples of the kinds of things that we do to try to make very explicit this problem of arguing, perspective taking, and academic language. And the seventh grade units, which I, I'm just... Pre present the, the cover of the first one here. I, we're very proud of these because we just finished implementing them and the students in the seventh grade all um, stood up and, and cheered for, these, for, the, for this uh, curricular uh, sequence, six units about the lost boys of the Sudan. The topic that we were meant to be teaching was geography. Now geography can be made really, really, really boring. Uh, so uh, the approach to geography was take, take these kids in South Sudan and follow them from South Sudan into Ethiopia to which they fled and then into Kenya where they finally found refuge in a camps and then to Minnesota where they um, were transported and then to Boston where we interview them as adults. Um, so you get quite a lot of uh, map experience and, and knowledge about ecological um, differences and so forth. Obviously, to test our model, we have to have some novel construct. We have these novel constructs. We have to have some novel instruments. Um, and one novel instrument that, uh, and we have them for all of these, uh, but one of the novel instruments that I'm particularly uh, uh, pleased with, not, I can't say proud of because I had nothing to do with producing it, was produced by my colleague Paola Uccelli and her, her team. And it's one of the ones I think Shoshana would have really liked. Um, the process of developing it is sort of predictable, but here is how Paola has uh, conceptualized the accessibility of this domain by uh, specifying the domain of the, the importance of information packing as one dimension of academic language that you um, compress information using nominalization and, and relative clauses. Um, the importance of linking ideas explicitly, importance of marking discourse structures. That's why we like the fact that kids in their little essays do a sentence at the beginning about the claim and a sentence at the end summarizing uh, the position. And um, uh, awareness, whether they know that they're, when academic language is required and also what it, what it looks like. So the tasks that are included in the battery for this um, for academic language are, is one, defining words, again, going back to a very old, um, a, a very old theme of, of work that Shoshana and I both have done, whether the definitions are formal 
or casual. Uh, this is a little item for connecting ideas. Uh, Allie was sick. She stayed home and did not go to school. What's the right linking word there? Um, tracking themes. Scott's team and Johnson's team tried to reach the top of the tallest mountain. Johnson's team made it to the top first because of this explorer's leadership. Who is this explorer? Kids are quite, sometimes quite confused about how referential chains like that link ideas through texts. Um, organizing texts. Uh, this is an argumentative text, and the initial words in those sentences give you a sense of what the right order should be. If kids recognize the importance of the discourse markers, they can solve this problem. And if they don't, they don't have any idea what order to put the sentences in. Morphology, um, complex morphological markers. A simple sentence comprehension. This is really more a control than a a piece of the, of the academic language test. And then the, this task of identifying register. Um, four defini three definitions, each one define whether it was written for children or adults. A debate is a thing where people talk and discuss their opinions. That's a kind of a complex one. A debate is when you argue about something. Uh, those, and then a debate is a discussion of two or more opposing uh, positions, or viewpoints. Right? So the use of the proper superordinate as a marker of formal adult uh, just definitions. Um, we have lots and lots of data about this test, and I won't bore you with all the details, except to say that all the psychometric work has been done, and it looks wonderful. And um, we have uh, a very nice distribution uh, of scores. Um, for kids aged 9 through 14, um, showing that it picks up variation. We can actually test differences among, among students. And that reliability and validity are, are good. And uh, you can sort of see the developmental pattern here. Those are just distributions of scores for fourth grade. And then fifth grade, it moves a little to the right. And then sixth grade, it moves a little farther to the right. And then seventh grade and eighth grade, even, even farther. So clearly, this is developmentally sensitive, um, suggesting that these are skills that kids are learning precisely in this age range. Um, and that same developmental pattern is visible for every one of the subdomains, connecting ideas, tracking themes. In every case, the eighth grade score is best, and the fourth grade scores, scores worst. Um, on the test. So um, the, most importantly, I guess, from the point of view of our uh, utilization of this task as uh, a measure of a malleable factor is, is the fact that um, it does relate uh, pretty powerfully to performance on our state academic assessment. Uh, so kids who score proficient on that test have a mean on the academic language evaluation of 0.7, and those who score, who fail the test in the warning have a mean of 0.5. So external validity uh, is pretty good. So I can't tell you that our uh, new and enriched and um, expanded and even more discussion-based curriculum really works, because we don't really have any outcomes on kids yet. What we have are a lot of process measures. Um, we will have pre and post tests on all of those measures. We will have uh, a lot of analytic work to track developmental trajectories. Um, but what we have so far are things like this. Uh, in classroom, every, every unit we ask kids, so did you talk? Um, did you talk a little? Did you talk a lot? If you did talk, why? If you didn't talk, why not? And we get reports uh, somewhere between, it goes up over the course of the, of the year, but um, somewhere between 50 and 90% and of kids report that they did participate in the debates. Um, we ask them whether they would like to learn more about the topics of the week. And uh, we see that somewhere between 45 and and 70% say they'd like to learn a lot more about the topic of the week. Um, and when we say, why the kids who respond, who respond that they didn't talk, 
um, give us these answers to the questions, why not? Because I want to listen. Well, that's actually not bad, right? Better listening than uh, because I hated the whole thing. Um, or because I don't like to talk in front of the class. Um, sorry. Uh, this one, who, who talked quite a lot, started out at the very beginning by saying, I want to share my ideas so my classmates knew what I was thinking about. Um, and this is the kid who doesn't need this curriculum. Um, and I talked during the discussion because everybody took turns. But here are the, the really positive cases. The kids who at the beginning say, I don't feel comfortable in front of the class. And then four weeks later say, I talked in this debate because I thought everyone should listen to my opinion. Uh, which is, I think, a very important stage to get kids to, that they have the sense that they have the right to speak. And one of the striking things in the classrooms we visit that are not implementing this curriculum is how little right students have to talk. They have to, exp to talk about things of interest to them. They have a right to answer questions and get, and get evaluated and whether it's right or wrong, but they don't have the right to express actual opinions. So teachers um, are, in general, um, well, the teachers we work to, that we, we get responses from are pretty enthusiastic about this curriculum. The teachers we don't get responses from, I guess, are not. Um, but here's a, one example of how teachers respond to those little, those little essays. Um, and this is a, um, a, a fourth grade topic. Uh, should, uh, you know, it, there's a tsunami and the, uh, should we collect money to send it to Japan uh, to help them? Right? I think it's our moral obligation to help people far away because if a tsunami hit us, who would help us? So if we help them, they will soon help us when we need it. Our, our current, obviously there's a word left out there, our current now could affect us in the future. That's a pretty articulate statement of do unto others. Um, the, a, a classmate of that child wrote this. I feel that we should help something uh, if we could. Can somebody else read that? I don't know. But anyway, I mean, this is uh, the range of skill in literacy that you get within a typical fourth grade class. Um, but one of the basic claims we would like to make is that the ideas of these different kids who articulate them well or badly are more similar to one another than the literacy skills and that giving kids an opportunity to express the ideas in authentic communicative context orally first before they have to do it in writing is a primary mechanism for getting better. So. Um, so far, the impacts are high levels of student enthusiasm, mixed levels of teacher enthusiasm. Results from a pilot year, because I can't show you because the power is too low and the statisticians won't release it, but uh, they were promising. Um, but we'll soon have data from more than 7,000 students in 33 schools. So um, if we ever get it all analyzed, um, we, will, we will know where the effects are strong and where not. Um, so in, in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that attention to peer talk may be even more critical in later grades than in early childhood education. I mean, I'm not saying it isn't important and valuable in early childhood, but I think it's, it's allowed in early childhood because you can't stop it. In, uh, and it's sort of neglected as a resource for learning and teaching in later for, for older kids. And yet these kids um, benefit enormously, at least in terms of engagement and and we think in uh, cognitive and, and language learning as well. Discussion in US classrooms is vanishingly rare. Um, estimates are that it happens about a minute per hour in, on average, and maybe three minutes per hour in classrooms serving high-streamed uh, high students, high-tracked students, almost never in <coughs> classrooms serving low-tracked students. Um, and yet, those are the ones who, pri who will primarily benefit because they operate so much more effectively in oral language contexts than they do in contexts where they are limited to trying to read and process texts that are too hard for them. So um, we see it as a powerful stimulus to thinking better and to using more sophisticated language forms. Um, and I can only hope that uh, pretty soon we will have the data that strongly support that set of claims. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, these websites will be of help. Thank you very much.
Should I take questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I can tell you that uh, th they are, to some extent, all of the above. We do we provide guidance about a variety of different discussion formats, um, but we also uh, encourage teachers to do what they find natural and and uh, accessible. Partly because, and, and this is, there's a, an interesting sort of split in educational, on impact evaluations in education. There's a whole group of people who get big effect sizes in testing in, uh, uh, interventions by going in and carefully controlling how it's done, often sending graduate students or master teachers in to implement the intervention and then seeing the effect. And we chose very explicitly not to do it that way. We chose to try to embrace messiness, right? to sort of t take it and make it a real world uh, problem. So we recognized that teachers would implement well and badly, enthusiastically and, 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 and aggressively, uh, that, and, that, um, and that they would have, um, despite our professional development, which we hope raises the ceiling, different preferences for how to do it. So one of the, so I can tell you that the full, cl the, the class debate sessions are run in, in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's just sit in a circle, sort of sit in a circle and say what you think. Sometimes it's um, like a four corners debate. If you strongly agree that rap music should be censored, go over there. If you strongly disagree, go over there. If you sort of agree, go over there. If you sort of disagree, go over there. Talk in your little group, decide what your best argument is, and then we'll ask somebody from your group to present it. Sometimes it's a fishbowl. Half of you get together, take your positions, now present it to the whole group, and we'll, we'll um, score you. We'll fill out a rubric and tell, tell you whether we thought you did a good job or not. Um, it, everything and, and, and anything. In other parts of the curriculum, there are opportunities for small group discussions, which are typically student run and student led. So uh, it's, it's all of the above. The other thing I can say though is that we have in many classrooms now collected absurd tapes and, and transcripts. And um, I hope that's not mine. Oh my God. Um, uh, and so we're analyzing the affordances of different models for discussion. So for example, uh, in one class the teacher is quite there, <laughs> quite involved in, uh, in, in guiding the discussion. And in another class, same topic, same curriculum, the teacher kind of sits back and lets the kids run it. In the class with the teacher guidance, I'll have to say the discussion is more sophisticated. There's more input of, uh, mm. his, of tr it's a, this is in social studies, true historical perspectives, right? Like, this, is, this is a discussion that a historian would like a lot better because there is historical thinking going on. But there are really only two or three perspectives getting represented. And the one with all the kids, there's this historical thinking isn't so obvious, but there are about eight perspectives getting expressed, right? So there's more richness to the discussion. So I think it's, you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. We won't know in an experimental way which works best, but we'll have some correlational data. Yeah. Regarding the mathematics, so I can see where I mean, mathematics, as we know, is a huge problem. But how are you planning to incorporate discussions in mathematics? Well, we kind of fake that, I'll have to say, <laughs> by discuss by in, incorporating discussions of the topic that then motivate the math problem. Right. So the discussions are more about the data that get analyzed or, uh, you know, the topic might be something like junk, junk food. It, it might be, 
you know, the math problem is an analysis of calories per gram or something, but the discussion is, gee, uh, which would you rather, if you only had 250 calories to spend on junk food, would you rather have this kind or that kind? So it's, sometimes we, we kind of, they're more adjoined than truly uh, integrated. I was wondering whether you uh, gave any attention to differences between boys and girls in the discussion, mm. especially in view of cultures where girls are not referred to so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we, I mean, we do have lots of um, descriptive data. We have implementation data from every classroom three or four times a year. So we'll have lots of discussions to analyze from that perspective. And um, I, I think we do see what, what is commonly, which we, well, we just replicated, right? That the first comment is almost always from a man or a boy, right? <laughs> that uh, that uh, girls join the conversation a little later. Um, but I, and, and it's actually, it's very interesting you bring this up because one of the reasons that principals are very wary of discussion is they think it leads to inequities. They think it leads to advantages for boys over girls. But we'll know, I guess, whether that's true or not. I don't, I can't, I don't have any instincts yet as a, uh, to, to say that. I certainly, in the videotapes I've looked at, there are a lot of girls talking as well. Yeah. That would be great to do. We don't yet, but whether, and, and whether it's amount of talk in the discussion or amount of individual talk and also uh, exposure to, yeah, yeah. It, that will, will be hard to do because it's hard to identify individuals uh, in, we have uh, for eight classrooms, which is a tiny proportion of the total, we have video uh, video sequences, sort of video uh, case studies. But many classrooms we don't because we couldn't get permission from the teachers or enough of the students to videotape. So that, that will have to be a sort of small scale study. Yeah, you could, if you believe what kids say, then we could do that. Yeah, no, that's a great point, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not sure we can always believe what they say, but, <laughs> but, yeah. Everybody's saying this is huge data set and it's projecting their own fantasies on data sets. So, <laughs> sure. Just in. And I was wondering whether and what the control conditions look like. So, are they, were these teachers that were interested in were not going to do part of the program, or did they do a part of the program, but not the discussion part, maybe? No, the, that is a great question. I should have been clearer about that. Because of the way the program is organized in the middle grades, it wouldn't matter in the lower grades, but in the middle grades, it's actually implemented at a whole school level. So teachers, teachers are either in a school that's randomly assigned to do it or not. And what that means is that there are obviously subgroups of teachers who are in schools that get assigned to do it who aren't that interested. Um, what, it's one of the reasons I think why we're going to have much stronger, a much stronger study actually in fourth and fifth grade. Fourth and fifth grade are self-contained classrooms. Teachers p have the time to do this. They don't have as much com competition from alternative demands. Um, and, and we're getting better effects in fourth and fifth grade than sixth, seventh, eighth, where it has to be math, science, social studies, um, and English language arts teacher all together agreeing to do it. So any one of them can undermine the, uh, the success of the program. Although I suppose you could say any one of them could also carry the program <coughs> if you were an optimist, but I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we do have natural variation, absolutely. 
We have, um, yeah, there, that happens well in schools where the so social studies teacher, for example, just decides not to do it. Although one thing that happens in those schools is the kids really complain bitterly. Because they don't complain about the math teacher not doing it, but they complain about, this, about missing the debate. They really like the debate. So, it, but yeah, um, we, it's one of the reasons we're collecting that notebook data, is it gives us some sense of where the holes are in implementation. It's 7,000 notebooks that thick. It's a little bit of a logistical problem, I have to say. Where people are complaining that they have no room in their offices for anything but piles of notebooks. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask about uh, the added curriculum that you uh, put into the program. Uh -huh. um, usually, uh, the teachers feel very connected to their textbooks that are linked to high school Yeah. How do they let go? <laughs> um, well, in, uh, there, there are no social studies high stakes assessments, right? Uh, the, the social studies is not in, included in the high stakes assessments. So that makes that easy. Uh, and that's because, of course, because it is only, it is a, a myth that the United States are united, uh, particularly on the question of what you should teach in history. So because there are very local standards about, about social studies teaching, there, there are no um, broad-based assessments. Science is, a, is linked to high states assessment only in one grade, typically. So it, too, is a little freer. And fourth and fifth grade, uh, so, so uh, we do get some pushback from teachers in the grade where there's a high stakes assessment. But the science curriculum, the science units and the social studies units are only six weeks, although actually teachers often take eight or ten weeks to implement it. But they're not the entire year. So they can still do their, their own curriculum. And that was what you said, the, the way they love their own uh, programs was part of the reason we decided we would ask them to substitute just a small piece and not the whole year. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, well, all of the above. We have the basic professional development model is a summer institute for new, new adopters or new uh, teachers uh, with sort of three days of largely focused on explaining the curriculum and motivating the, the, um, the changes in practice. Um, we have coaches in all of the schools. We have coaches who visit all of the schools once a week meet with the teachers and do follow-up professional development, uh, go into classrooms and observe, and, and operate in that very ambiguous coaching zone from being enforcers to being supporters. Um, and so the coaches do everything from saying, well, I'll teach, the class, I'll teach this for you this week, right? So you can see how it can go, to um, let's co-teach it, to you know, that was interesting, you did this really well, here's something you could work on next time. Sort of the full range of possible scaffolds and supports. We also are working now on developing more videos of good discussion as preparation for the teachers, but we've also started using them as uh, demonstrations for the students, the sort of showing them in classrooms and saying, you know, the class next door just had this great discussion. Um, you guys aren't doing discussion yet. Would you like to do something like this? And uh, using the students, it's a pr probably a little, a little uh, suspect, isn't it? But anyway, using the students to demand discussion of the teachers. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, it's kind of odd, I think, that how do, how, what is the alternative? I mean, to teach only to write? <laughs> no discussions taking place in social studies? I mean, I mean, oh, well, there are things taking place that teachers call discussions. I don't, it's not that they don't hold discussions. They all say they hold discussions. But they're discussions that are like, uh, you know, uh, what, what year did the Civil War end? Uh, wh what, did, what was the occasion for the Gettysburg Address? Um, who wore gray and who wore blue? I mean, they're, they're, they're pseudo-discussions. They're recitations rather than 
gee, do you think the North really won the Civil War? No, I mean, that's a discussion question. But it's more also the debate thing, I think, that is kind of primary that doesn't take place in many of the classes. Yeah, right. And the, and the discussion, as you said, is kind of limited, but I think this is a new form of orality. The debate, I mean, debate takes place in American schools, at least after school. <laughs> it's a club. It's not uh, an intrinsic part of discussion, yeah, of, of instruction, yeah. Yeah. Last question, I think. All right, first and last. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask about the quality of the discussions, national measurement, and I would like to know about uh, whether you took into consideration of, uh, the fact that there is a, a peer, uh, the fact that uh, students constructed ideas uh, one on the other. Mm. Right. Okay. No, that's a great question, and we have we have now finalized um, a, a an observation instrument, which we call the Lido, because you know why not let your research assistants think they're attending a a nightclub, um, <laughs> it, it, which stands for low inference direct observation, I think. Um, and a base, the basic model, the, I, w I have to give credit to Kathy O'Connor, a colleague on, who's developed, I, our strongly influenced our ideas about discussion and, and engaged in professional development with our teachers about discussion. And her model is this. There are, like, there are four things that you want to you attend to. Right? Lowest level of discussion is, is, can the kids hear each other? <laughs> Does anything go on to make sure the kids can hear? which is often a problem in America. It's not quite a big, as big a problem as in Israeli classrooms, I think, but it's, a big, but it's also a problem in American classrooms. Um, the second level is, are they listening? So what percent of students are actually kind of engaged in listening to each other? And then are they um, actually articulating uh, credible or you know, defensible or defended positions? So are they saying something that is comprehensible, uh, that's relevant to the topic? And then the fourth level is the one, do, do they ever respond to each other? Right? Now, this ever, this, getting to level three is not so hard. Getting to level four is, is, is really tough. But you start to see around about November, December, January, you start to see students actually saying things like, well, Malika, said, but I disagree because, right? So that you actually do get this response to one another. Um, and that, and we sort of, uh, th that's, those are the golden, the golden <coughs> moments in our tapes and transcripts. So it does happen, but I, I could hardly argue that it's frequent. It's, it's not. And it's actually, when you think about it, it's not that frequent in adult <laughs> discussions either. Um, I, the, the notion that you should listen to people and change your mind because of what they said or, or defend what you said more powerfully because of what they said. Uh, but that is indeed precisely the, the, the those are the, the highest quality uh, that we've ever identified in discussion. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you all for your comments. And we're now ready to